Chip Block, and uh, I want to thank you all and thank all our uh, Facebook Live uh, folks online. Uh, we, we stream this out, so uh, we're, we're uh, super glad to have everybody here. Uh, uh, Chip Walk is uh, operated by the Gunflint Trail uh, Historical Society. Uh, we get no uh, government funding of any sort, so we survive by people coming and making donations and becoming members. So I would invite you all, if you uh, can, to, to become members. And uh, without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to our introducer to introduce our speaker. Okay, I guess I'm the, I'm the official introducer. Um, Bonnie recruited me yesterday. I'm Jane Johnson. I'm a volunteer at Chick Walk, and I've been a volunteer probably since it opened in 2010. So it's a place that, that is near and dear to my heart. And I have the honor of introducing Mary Danny today. Mary is a um, local DNR conservation officer who has had that job for... I don't know how many years, many. About 17 and a half. 17 and a half years. And um, in addition to being a local conservation officer, she does water or instruction for school safety instructor for firearm safety and ATV safety. So is on the um, Department of Natural Resources um, Honor Guard, and so is very active in community, supporting the community and people. And in addition to her work supporting um, the fish and game um, laws, she also has a passion for sled dogs. And Mary and her partner Julie maintain a team of 30 or 35 sled dogs at their home outside of Portland. <coughs> as well as having five house dogs. And so I think Mary today is going to talk about both of those things, her work as a conservation officer and about conservation and how that ties in with um, sled dog racing or care. So I will turn it over to Mary. <clears throat> stories and mostly this will be some storytelling um, but I'll give you a little bit of background um, I didn't grow up in Minnesota I actually grew up in Michigan which is a very different area because I grew up downstate uh, so troll by birth uh, having grown up under the bridge uh, and it's a very nice place to be from moving to Minnesota it's a, a whole different environment and, and I spent a, a number of years working in juvenile corrections taking kids out into the woods and, and doing that sort of thing. During that time in, in school, I was a, a new guy for the Girl Scouts for a while. Um, so I got a pretty good exposure to the outdoors. And at some point in time, during my career, decided that I wanted to not only just take folks out and to experience it, but to, to help do something to educate folks and to help um, preserve what I find very valuable. And so I made a career change and, and got into this job as it happened, I had sled dogs well before I started this. Um, when I got hired, I was fortunate enough that um, this was the first station that I was offered and the first station that I moved to. So for me, it was an amazing opportunity to both make the career change I wanted to make and be able to bring my sled dogs, who I've, I've been running sled, sled dogs for about, <laughs> for about 25 years. So it was a nice opportunity to come up here and be in an area where I could use those dogs both just for fun, but also for you know, some boundary wise patrol. So for folks who don't know, as a conservation officer, um, my job is fishing game enforcement largely, but it also involves um, wetlands conservation, waters, uh, law enforcement, um, well, all manner of wrecked vehicles, whether it's snowmobiles, ATVs, watercraft, um, all of those things are all part of it. Well, my station is, includes Lake Superior, so I might be on Lake Superior working out there, working boaters and, and fishermen, and it also includes you know, all the inland lakes and the boundary waters. As you all probably know, accessing the boundary waters in the summer, not too bad. Um, I am not a really great skier. Uh, I do okay, but I'm not the best skier. And if I'm gonna go in, I would prefer to, 
I don't know if it's really any easier, but I can certainly make much better time hooked up to a team of dogs. And so, you know, for winter enforcement in the boundary waters where I'm going out there looking to, you know, checking on folks, you know, are they being legal with their camping? Are they doing things that are destructive? Are they doing things that are foolish and they might get hurt and, and they put themselves at risk? Are they, you know, are they following the laws as far as fishing in stuff goes? Um, so all of those things are, are things that we do in the winter time. And having having a team of dogs available to help with some of that has been uh, has been a bonus for me. This is Sean, and Sean is a uh, Sean is a retired sled dog. Uh, you can pet him later if you want, or you can come up and pet him if you want. This is Sean is about four or five years old. He's a youngster, uh, but he has seizures, and so we found that for Sean, well, he loves to pull, and he would do it. You know, all day long. He has some medical issues, so I don't really want to push him with that, and I don't want to put him at risk or put other dogs near him at risk. So he gets to lounge around on the house and, and you know, on the couch and on the bed. So he's, pretty, he's pretty spoiled, but he likes to watch. You know, when we hook up the dogs, he can stand at the window and watch everybody get hooked up and watch them run and leave and come back. So it's actually, for him, it's pretty pretty win-win because he gets all the excitement of watching the, the hookup. And, None of the work of having to actually pull me around. So, so he's pretty excited about that. So that's John, and that's that's kind of his story. So um, if you've got specific questions, I can um, I can save a little bit of time at the end. But I'll just like I said, I figured I'd just put together some different stories of, of some adventures that that the boss and I have had together um, for work stuff. A few stories from from not work stuff, and a few you know, dog or unrelated uh, non-dog work story. So um, I'll tell you about the first time that I took my dogs out in the boundary waters. Hold on him because he's, he's looking a little interested. Um, so I, as I said, I, I've been doing this job for about 17 and a half years. So this was the first station that I got um, back in 2005. And so <clears throat> I'm not sure if you're aware, but there are a few cabins in the boundary waters that the state owns. And they're used for um, primarily winter patrol stuff. Um, we'll use them some for, for summertime, um, but they give up a safe base for whether it's you know, our enforcement staff or fishery staff or uh, you know, U.S. Forest Service wilderness crews to have a place where if the weather goes to hack or you want to store some things, you know, it's, we've got a building that's, I believe, dated back to the, um, I think the earliest date that we could find in there last time I was in was about 1930, 1940. So it's an older log cabin that's been um, refurbished a few times, but um, it's, it's not anything really fancy, but it's a dry place and a, and a bad storm. So when I first started, the cabin was kind of in a bit of disrepair, and there was a lot, it was kind of becoming a, a place to, to store things that just really needed to just be trash. And so my supervisor at the time, who had never really didn't know dogs much, and was an okay cross country skier, kind of like myself. She said, Well, you know, I've got all this stuff that, you know, we've got some old mattresses and some things at the cabin. It'd be really nice just to get that stuff out in the wintertime. Do you think you could do that with the dog team? Sure, I, I, I'm like, okay, I've done, I've done a fair bit of racing. I've done a lot of boundary waters camping, not for work, but just going in and camping. So I'm pretty, I felt pretty comfortable on a sled. I said, yeah, we can probably do that. And she's like, well, you know, would, would your dogs tow me on, on my skis if we just threw a line and towed like water skis? And I'm like, yeah, they won't, they're not going to notice you on a pair of skis dragging along behind. So I'm like, yeah, that's fine. And I have friends who I've camped with who do that same sort of thing. They, have a, they run a sled, and run a tag line, and tow a skier. So I was like, okay, this is fairly familiar. Okay, yeah, we can do that. So, all right, we can make this plan and we go. So we get out to the landing, we take off, and and where it's, where it's not on portages, and we're on the lake, and it's nice and smooth. She's like, I'll just put my skis on and just pull along the line. Okay, this sounds good. This is my supervisor, who I've known for about six months. She's my boss. And I'm like, all right, well, she's about game for this. I'm game for this. So we take off down the lake, and first lake goes smooth, and we get to the portage. And, and this is the portage from rounded, what's the next one from round? Not coming up with it. Anyway, not a bad point. It's a little long, but not too bad. So we do that, and that goes pretty well. And then she gets on the skis, and we go across the next leg. And so we're making our way. Every time we get to the portage, she, you know, she skis along across the portage or walks. Depends on the, you know, how the conditions were. 
okay, this is going really smoothly. And at some point we get onto one of the bigger lakes and the wind has blown all the snow off the lake and I'm thinking, this does not look good. Mm -hmm. Because dog sleds are designed to go. And they have, you know, so you've got plastic, you know, plastic runners on it so that they, they slide very quickly on the snow. And on ice they slide a whole lot more. But they don't necessarily track really straight, so if you get a little bit of wind or a little bit of ice, they, they can do a little bit of swinging around. And, and skis are kind of the same way. If you have cross-country skis that don't have a lot of ledges, they kind of slide around a little bit. Depending on your skill level, that's maybe good, maybe not so good. You get out of the lake and I'm thinking, this just doesn't look. This looks a little sketchy. Make like, sure you're good back there, because after having been on a sled for a number of years, granted the sled is probably about as wide as one of these benches. So you're standing with your feet about this far apart. It's not you know, if, if you want to stand, it's a little awkward and weird with people you don't know really well, but you can stand really close together on the on the sled and run together. And you can stand right behind me. She's like, oh, I think I'm okay, Tolan. Okay. So it, it, you know, if, if we get going really fast, I'll try to stop them, but it might be a little bit it might be a little sketchy because there's not really good snow for the brake. Brake works better on snow and ice. And she's like, I'm feeling okay. Okay. We take off and we're going along and like, oh, this is going a whole lot better than I thought it was. Then, so I'm relaxing a little bit and she's going along behind me. And I hear something and I look back and I'm like, uh oh, there she is dragging along on the ski. The ski is going. I'm like, oh, dang it! I'm trying to break. I'm like, what? Are you, why are we stopping? We're having a good time. We're going like heck. And finally, I get her to stop and she gets up and comes skiing over. She's like. Yeah, maybe I should ride along. <laughs> 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 That's good. And then the rest of the trip ended up being fairly uneventful. We had uh, we had a couple portages to dodge around in the winter time. You know, if, if you're talking about portages that go around flowages and things, little rivers and such, um, sometimes the ice around those things isn't as good as, as you really want it to be. So we had to do a little picking through some uh, through some areas. And uh, one of the advantages is. To having fires come through and get rid of some of the um, some of the buildup of, of fire uh, firewood that, that's down, as you do have some you get some break areas um, that are burned through or that are cut by the crews. And we were fortunate that in one of the locations where we needed to kind of cut around um, a pretty serious flow that we would have had a little difficult time navigating, we were able to go through a, a big burn area that we could locate on the map and just kind of bushwhack our way through, which was. Um, a, a little bit, you know, an, an exciting team of dogs bushwhacking while somebody walks ahead and figures out, you know, okay, this is where we're going to go. The dogs are kind of like, could, could we just go? We can, we'll figure it out. No, we're going to take our time. So that was mostly a, a, the rest of the trip was pretty uneventful, and coming back out was was pretty uneventful. But I just remember thinking, all right, well, if I can, if I can drag my boss around for a while, and she's okay with it. I guess we're. I guess we're okay. so, so I was like, oh, that was a, that was a close one. Um, a lot of the a lot of the trips that I have done working with the dogs um, in the boundary wires have involved going up. Um, Ely has a pretty not so much now as it has had in the past, but has a pretty good um, a pretty good bunch of folks that have worked out there as uh, guides in the winter time, taking folks fishing. Um, Basswood's a pretty popular destination, and it's pretty easy to access. So they get a lot of folks who are going in there for fishing. Um, or Knife also has a lot of folks that go in and they can get in um, often off the Fall Lake Portage. Um, so I've done a lot of work with the Ely Wardens. Um, so it's not unusual for me to get a call or an email from one of the Ely guys saying, hey, kind of want to go up and go check this out. Or you know, when the, um, the crappie bite's been really good, and I'll get to, hey, the, the bite's really on, and if you've got any time to go in, you know, we'd love to be able to just run in for a day. Cause, it takes a bit of time to go all, you know, to ski all the way into Basswood, which you know, the younger guys have no problem doing. You know, you're talking 45, 50 years old, like, mm, I don't know if I really want to ski, you know, five mm -hmm. hours or you know, whatever in, and then check, do all my checks and then back out. So it's not unusual for me to get calls from those guys. Um, I've worked a lot with uh, an officer named Marty Stagg. He and I did several trips together. Marty was always funny because we would go in. And, we set up the camp and, and I'd get the dogs picking it out and, and then I would, you know, get all the dogs if they were wearing booties, booties off the moon, get them rested, get them all fed. And, and meanwhile, Marty's watching me, he's like, I don't know how you do it. He's like, I, are you over there giving them pedicures? Or, you know, 
and watching him, brushing him and loving him. I was like, this just seems like so much work. And I was like, well, it is, but it is. And I was like, I, I enjoy it. I said, and I want to make sure that they're in good shape so that when we need to go back out, we're, you know, we're ready to go. Um, so Marty and I did a number of trips. Um, one of the trips that we did was hot, you know, it's a hot fishing bike. So we're like, okay. You know, there's you know, a bunch of cars in the parking lot. So like, all right, we're gonna find something. And there was a couple of dog trucks there that I didn't recognize the trucks. And you, when you run dogs for a while, you, you start to recognize people's vehicles. So you know who's a lot of the people out there running dogs. So you know, oh, that's an outfitter. So generally speaking, the outfitters are pretty good because they want to maintain the resource and protect the resource so that they can continue to work because that's their livelihood. Um, so they're pretty invested in doing things correctly. Some you know, folks who are not, who are just coming up for a weekend or whatever, sometimes they are very invested and sometimes they are less invested. So it's good to go check those folks. So we can look at, hmm, don't recognize either of those vehicles. Um, you know, around the place to find out who they belong to. And yep, don't know those folks. So we thought, all right, let's go in and we'll go, we'll go find them. We've got, you know, not a whole lot of other folks out there, but there's at least somebody going. So we go in and it was a decent trail going in and we get out to the lake and and my dogs are still all excited because it's about five miles or so. It's a, the four mile portage, which is fairly flat. So we just run it about five or six miles and we you know, we're following this set of dog tracks. And we're like, okay, yep, there's a sled trail. So we know where these guys are fishing at. And, and we're like, oh, yeah, that's, I, I know a bather in there. You know, it's, you know, the bike's been on, so I'm not surprised that's where they are. Okay, great. So we go in there and like, coming around the corner, like, can we stop here? I'm like, sure. So we stopped on the mouth of the bay. Just, just around the corner. He's like, well, because they're in the bay, he says, I want to be able to sit watching for a while. You know, which is pretty typical game warden stuff. It's nice to sit, watch folks without contacting, because if you want to know what somebody's doing, you sit and you watch them. And generally speaking, you can watch and you know, are they doing things as they should, or are they doing things that we are going to really want to have a conversation with them. So, so I'm like, yeah, I can, we can stop here. I, I think I can hold them. So I'm standing, you know, I get the snow hook, because on the sled you have a big hook that you put in the snow. And you stomp on it, and that gives you a break, your, kind of your emergency break. So I put that in, and I'm trying to stand on that. And we actually had snow on the lake, so it was good. So I put the hook in, and, and it's holding good. And Mark's like, okay, I'm going to grab my binoculars, I'm going to sneak up around this corner, I'm going to watch. Perfect, okay. So as soon as Marty grabs the binoculars and goes up in front of the dogs, what do the dogs do? They're like, oh, he's going, it must be time to go. So they start barking. So I'm standing up and saying, shut up, shut up. He's like, I know that these people are going to sound carries across the frozen lake. I'm, so I'm picking up snowballs and I'm throwing them at my lead dog. Say, I'm going to up front and bark. And I'm like, shut up, say, shut up. And I don't want to yell at him. He's like, mm -hmm. So he, he's watching for a while. And the dog periodically, burp, burp, shut up, burp, burp, burp. Oh, This is not working. I'm like, they, I'm sure they can hear us. How can they not hear us? And then I hear dogs singing, howling. And, I'm like, mm -hmm. and then my dog's like, oh, somebody's singing. So we should sing. So they start singing. So I've got this chorus back and forth. And they think, this is not, this is not working. And eventually he comes, you know, sneaking back up. He's like, oh, I can see them, they're all out here fishing. He's like, and they're all, you know, they got a bunch of dope too. I'm watching them passing them, smoking dope. He's like, so this is just, we got business. We got business to do. I'm like, okay, well, great. Even if we don't have an over then we'll pull some dope off of them. And that's, you know, all right, that makes work, you know, worth the trip. So we <laughs> jump on the sled and we're off we go. And, and we come in and, you know, follow the trail. And there's, you know, three or four guys there and their dogs are, at the far end of the bay where their campsite is set up. And so you can see the dogs picking it out on the far end. And we come rolling up and, and we're in plain clothes because that's typically how we travel is, is in plain clothes. And we come rolling up and one of the guys looks over and he's jigging away and he's like, oh, hey, you guys here for the night bite? And we're kind of like, well, kind of like that, yeah. Kind of not really, you know, that's the night bite you're thinking of. So we stop and Marty hops off and we walk Game more than the guy's like, you could just see the look on his face, you know, that's not a game more. The guy's like, oh. He's like, we really aren't catching, you know, we don't caught much of the fish. He's like, oh, no, I didn't do saw what you did. So we collect up a bunch of stuff. And where's the rest of it? We got nothing else. Really? You're here and you know, you came all this way and that's all you had. But, all right, it's back at the you know, it's back at our tent. So it was one of those deals where <laughs> Motor back to where the dogs were, and you know, all the all the dogs at the picket line are like looking at us, and all my dogs are like, mm -hmm. we get to rest now too. And took care of business, and off we went. So that was that was kind of fun. So that's pretty typical sort of sort of thing that we're doing with the dogs. Um, and sometimes it works out really well like that, where you you 
You watch, you make your case, you go in, you take care of business. Other times, uh, another time Marty and I went in and on, uh, we thought, let's go in and we went on to uh, Snowbank, which is partly motorized and partly not. So we went in and we followed all these snowmobile trails and we were making contacts with all these folks who would look over, you know, because they rode in by snowmobile and they're watching this dog team come up and they're thinking, who is this person lost? You know, running around on the lake with a dog team, why did they not just bring a snowboard? So we had you know, run on up and I'd stay with the dogs and already run over and, and make contact, which is usually the easiest way to do it because you don't ever really want to leave your dog team. Because the snowbook usually holds, but if the snowbook doesn't hold, then they decide that they're gone. Now you're chasing and then you look, A, I don't run fast, and B, you look really, kind of looks bad if you're chasing your dogs and your dogs are all looking like you. Keep running, keep running, you'll catch us maybe. <laughs> so anyway, so so like we, we, we made our way around Snowbank and, and thought, well let's let's see if anybody's been in on disappointment like. You know, it's just a, and, you know, sometimes folks are in there, sometimes they're not. So we head across the portage of the disappointment and and generally speaking, I am the person driving the sled and whoever I'm working with is the person riding on the sled with me. And sometimes they ride on the runner, sometimes they just put them in the basket because it's, it's got a big basket. It's a nice place you just sit there and you, know, you go for a ride, which is kind of an kind of easy deal. And on Portage is where it's really rough. It's better to be sitting down than falling off. Um, so they're like, okay, let's go into disappointment. We get across the Portage and it's a little rough in spots. It's like, well, keep your arms inside the ride because you know, there's, there's a couple of tight places where the sled's bottom. And like, oh, I hope I don't hit anything. We get to the other side and there's not a track on the lake. I'm like, huh, well, we're here. We'll go out and we'll just make a loop around the lake and, and come back because we're already on the lake, so we might as well, even though there's nobody else there. So we take off down the, you know, down the, from the landing and onto the lake and we go about a, eh, 100, 150 yards and all of a sudden I see my front two, four dogs. They're running along in the snow and all of a sudden they're not running along in the snow. They've just dropped right into the slush. And they're standing, you know, up to their armpits and slush, and they all stop and they all look back and be like, oh, "Are you kidding me?" <laughs> like, oh, this is not good. So, like, this isn't good. We both look at each other and we're like, perhaps this was a bad idea. Perhaps disappointment is a disappointment. <laughs> so, I look at Marty, who's wearing a pair of like Sorrel boots, pack boots. And because it was spring washing, I've got on my knee-high rubber boots. And I look at his footwear and I look at my footwear and I thought, well, I know who's going into the slush. It's going to be the person wearing the mud. So I'm like, all right, fine. I'll go up and I'll get the lead dogs and we'll just make a circle. Because it's difficult to turn a sled around like on a dime. You kind of got to give them a little space and make kind of a loop so that everything is like, it's like taking a piece of string. You got to swing it around wide. So, so I'm like, all right, I'll swing the team around wide. And when they start to pivot, the sled will spin. I said, so hold on. You know where the brake is, because you've done some trips with me. I'm like, you know how to use the brake, right? Yep, 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 yep. Okay, I didn't snow hook. We're probably not going to go there, because it's sharp and pointy, and I don't want to jump in the snow hook and trying to hold on. So I'm like, just once the sled comes around, just make sure they're going slow. And then we'll just spin them around and go back. Okay, great. So I truck out through the slush, and there I am, and, you know, get up to my lead dogs, and we're like, okay, good, we're going back, right? I said, yes, let's you know, come around. And so I start to make the circle. And of course, as soon as they realize, yes, we're going back, because this is terrible, they all get excited and happy, like, oh, we're going back to the truck. Perfect. So I'm holding on, and I'm only holding on for so long, and then they yank the, you know, they yank the light out of my hands, and off they go. And unfortunately, I did that, the mistake of being on the inside of the line. Anytime you turn the team around, you always want to be to the outside. Because when they swing around and you're on the inside, they take you right out. And so, of course, they took me right out. And there I am, rolling around on the snow in the slush. And the dogs, they don't really care. Once, you know, once they know where they're going, you don't matter. We got the sled, we're fine, but we're, we're going back. So they take off. I see dogs, they like rolling over. And I see dogs running past me. And then I look up and I see the sled, which is now, you know, because of course they kind of crack the whip and the sled goes pulling and flying around and I look up and all I see is Mark on, you know, on the sled and I can see the look on his face like, oh, this isn't good, this isn't good, this isn't good. And I see the sled runners fly and I'm like, this isn't good. So I roll out, you know, there I am feeling like a fireman's roll, you know, thinking of fire, you know, oh, just roll, get on the road, roll. So I roll out of the way, boom, there goes the sled 
Yeah. Just in the front of the back. And then he finally gets it stopped. He's like, oh, like, are you okay? He's like, yeah, I'm fine. Are you okay? I'm like, yeah, I'm good. I'm good. Let's, let's just, just take a breath. I'm going to get on the sled. And then we're just going to go back to the truck. And so like, yeah. Got that down. It was all, all good. The, the, the moment of watching my life flash before my eyes and, and seeing all the plastic numbers. It's like, okay, yikes. Um, so that's a couple of, a couple of Ely stories. Uh, let's see. I'm trying to think of other things. I have had... Uh, Sometimes it's easy adventures like that. I did take in a couple of Border Patrol guys a few years ago uh, on a tag sled, um, which you have your sled with your dogs hooked to it, and then you just run a rope back, and, and then you put another sled on it behind it. So it's kind of like that whole water skier thing, only instead of a person on a pair of skis, you've got a whole other sled, which is about six or seven feet long, and then two guys on that sled. Which mostly was okay, except we hit uh, on the four mile portage. It happened to be a year where there was a lot of overflow and the beaver dams, and so it's going to be a nice, flat, easy trail. The whole trail kind of had this weird tilt to it where the water had flowed over it was all icy. And I kept telling them, if when in doubt, just let go and just roll off from this. So if something tips over, don't feel like you have to hold on because they're not going to necessarily slow down for you. I will hold on if they dump me because they're my dogs and I want to protect them. But if you're on the back sled and something happens and you dump over, just, just like, it's better than breaking <laughs> something. So they were cool with that. They, they understood that. And so as we were going through this, you know, up over the steamer dam, the whole, it's exactly what happened. We just, the sled starts to slide off and I'm like, oh, this is bad. And then we bounce into a birch tree and then I can hear the guys behind me because you know, the things are kind of jostling around and my sled is kind of, kind of coming to a stop and I can hear them sliding around on the back and they're still upright, so I'm like, okay, that's good. And then as I look back, there would happen to be another seal with me on my sled and if, you know, we're looking back and we're getting yanked by them because we're bouncing off the trees. Sled tips over and I'm like, oh, right into the water goes my, my partner. So he's like, you know, Arm right into the big, you know, fever, mucky, slushy water. It just smells wonderful. <laughs> and, and, you know, we, we come to a grinding halt and I'm like, ah, are you okay? And he's like, yeah, I'm fine. I'm just a little wet. He's like, I'm really glad I packed that extra pair of mittens. And he's like, he's like, I always do it. I never use them. And he's like, and I, sometimes I think, do I even need those? He's like, yes, yes, I do. And he's like, no, I'm extra glad that I bought them. But then I you know, went back to the Border Patrol guys. Are you guys okay? Yeah, that was kind of exciting. And I'm like, yeah, it really should we don't really want it to be exciting like that. But you know, so we got everybody back out and dug out the extra mittens. And of course the dogs are in front of the whole operation and the dogs are just standing there like, really? What are you guys doing back there? <laughs> we kinda wanna get going here. Are you guys not screwing around back right there? So that, that's the typical look that I get from my dogs on any of these sorts of adventures is they kind of give me that look of, are you done back there? What are you doing? Are you, you know, we stop to check fishermen's and the dogs are like, all right, we're giving you, giving you just a couple minutes. I, I hope everything looks good because if you got you know, to write tickets and stuff, we're ready to go. We don't, don't, don't want to be waiting around. So it's always, uh, it's always fun. It's always an adventure with them. Um, this, well, we've had a few, we've had a few adventures with the media too because people are very interested in what we do with the dogs. Um, in general, our job is, it can be very interesting. Most days it's pretty boring, but sometimes it is fairly interesting. Taking the dogs into the boundary waters is, is a different aspect of the job. Um, I think right now, well actually I know right now, uh, in the state of Minnesota, I am the only game warden that does this with dogs. Um, partly because I came to the job with the dogs, with the skills. Um, the state doesn't buy dogs. The state uh, bought some equipment a number of years ago with some federal money that they got. Um, they purchased some equipment for me to use, or whoever, it doesn't really matter. I just happen to have the dogs and the skills to be able to, to do this and have a station where I can utilize something that I, that I brought to the table. So I'm fairly fortunate in that I get to do what I love to do, both work and you know, bring my, my personal life into it. Um, somebody asked one of the new, uh, I, as part of my job for the DNR, I do a lot of training with our new folks, and one of the new guys asked me uh, last month, he's like, so, when you retire, is that going to be the end of the, the, the DNR dog sledding gig? And I'm like, I, 
I don't know, I said it kind of depends on, on who we hire. You know, it, over the course of you know the history of the agency, we've had officers who have had dogs, who have brought dogs, who've done um, backcountry patrols with dogs. So I'm certainly not the first person. Um, I have no no belief that I would be the last person to do it. I'm for, I feel fortunate that I am able to do it now and when I retire. You know, if they want to hire me back as a contractor, I'm like, yeah, I'll, you know, I'll, I'll do that. If you don't want to hire me and you just want to go out and go have fun and you, know, you get paid and I'll run my dogs, I'm fine with that too because I'm still going to have dogs. I'm still going to like to run in the boundary waters and run my dogs. So it's, it's kind of a win-win. But so as part of the, uh, the interest in what we do with the dogs, and I say me because think I have ever gone in by myself. Again, when you're running six or eight dogs, you always want to make sure that you you want to take care of the dogs. That's the primary thing is taking care of you know, taking care of the dogs. You got a job to do, you want to do that job, but to get in and out you need to make sure that your dogs are well, that your dogs are well cared for. So you always want to make sure that you've got somebody who can who can stay with the dogs and keep track of them while somebody else is doing business. And that's true. I've gone in with forest service folks gone in with other game wardens, but there's always a couple of us there so that we can do those sorts of things. So we've got care for the dogs and someone to do the job. Um, so as part of the interest in that, we've had an, on a couple of occasions, uh, I've been contacted by various media. So last, no, two winters ago, gosh, time flies. Two winters ago, I was contacted by Duluth News Tribune, and they wanted to go, hey, we'd like to send somebody in and, you know, we'd like to talk to you about what you do with your dogs. And, and we'd like to send somebody in to, to do some pictures and you know get some photos of you patrolling the boundary water. So I'm like, okay. So I spent a bunch of time talking on the phone with uh, um, with one of the um, one of the reporters for the news. Excuse me. And then he said, Well, I really like to send my photographer in. Do you think you could give him a ride into the boundary waters? Mm -hmm. mm, okay, I think okay. I'm like, so that's you know me. Um, my neighboring officer, uh, Tom Wallstrom, because again, you've got to have somebody to, take, you know, somebody to run the dog, somebody to run the business. And then I'm like, okay, so there's the two of us and, and a photographer. Okay, I, I have a sled that, I, I personally have a sled that has two different driving positions. So that, you know, one person can stand and they have a break, and that's the main driver. And then there happens to be behind them another place with a, a handlebar, a stand, and a brake. So that you've got two sets of brakes and two sets of handlebars. So it's, it's nice you, don't, you, can, you can both stand up and you can both see what's going on. And if, if you lose somebody, you still got a break. So that's, that's kind of nice. So I'm like, okay, well, that should work. We can put, you can put the photographer in the, in the basket and we'll take him in. So, okay, this will be good. Well, as it turned out, the, we went in, Tom and I went in, and we did kind of a dry run. We're like, let's go. We, we got an idea where we think we'll run into some people. So we went into... Uh, into Daniel's Lake. So we took the portage into Daniel's and ran in there and checked a whole bunch of people on what, um, one week in, I don't know, it was February or something. And lots of folks, you know, lots of people to check. So we're like, okay, this will be this will be a good place to bring a photographer. Easy to get in and out, um, pretty simple trail to ride, so we don't have to worry about dumping anybody. It should be pretty smooth. Great. Of course, we meet up with a photographer a week later. There's nobody hardly in the parking lot. And we're like, all right, well, there might be somebody on the lake, or there might not, so we're going to go in, because we've, you know, we've got everything, the dogs are all ready to go, the sled's ready to go, we're ready to go, so we'll meet up with the photographer, who fortunately has run dogs before in his lifetime, so he's like, I'm pretty relaxed, he's like, I'm very comfortable, I said, okay, we're going to have you in the basket, he's like, that's okay, he's like, fine, he says, do you mind if I take pictures while we go? Sure. He's like, I'll have a camera, and he's like, don't mind me, I'm just going to sit here and I'll do some video, and over my shoulder, and I'm like, Okay, that's cool. And I said, well, you know, we'll keep you mostly upright. And he's like, oh, don't worry. He's like, I, I, I used to run dogs. If we start to tip over, he said, I'll just bail out. Okay, perfect. You know the drill. So we, of course, go in. And as it would have happened, there were a few places where the you know, snow was starting to melt down. We could log or whatever. And a couple of times, sure enough, driving a, you know, that, a sled loaded with a body that isn't designed to be loaded with a body, we kind of, hi there, coming in on the ring. So we decided, well, we'll see how this goes. We get a couple of spots, and sure enough, we dump over a couple of times, and all I can see is dollar figures, because this guy's he's a photographer for the, for the News Tribune, so he's got all these expensive cameras and stuff, and I'm just thinking, oh my god, I'm not sure that, like, I don't know if this camera's going to make it through this, and I'm thinking, 
I don't know that there's a tort claim involved with, you know, with me taking him as a ride along because I didn't fill out a ride along form because he's not really, he's riding along, but he's not riding along. And I was like, oh, I don't know how this all works. And then, of course, every time we stop and, and we pull the sled back up, and he is laughing and he's having a good time. He's like, oh, don't worry, it's all fine. And he's like, I protected my from the road. But, Whew, all right, so off we go and we get onto the lake. And of course, as predicted, there is almost nobody on the lake. So we go by and there's a young couple fishing. And I look over and I go, hmm, yep. Tom and I both look and we go, oh yeah, we know them. A couple local, uh, couple local boats. And we're like, all right, well, Tom's like, I think I'm ready to check them. So we can check them more. Like, okay, so we're pretty sure they have license. It's like, well, we'll just go for a ride down the lake first and then we'll come back because they were just getting set up. So we're like, well, we come all this way, we'll make it work with the photographers a while. So we make the loop down the lane and, and come back up. And, and he's like, well, do you mind if we go over and check those folks? And we're like, yeah, that's, we, we don't mind. That's why we're here. So we make the big loop around the lake, see no one, except for this couple, and swing over. And, and you know, get off. And of course, he's, the photographer is very you know, polite. Do you guys mind if I, you know, can I get some pictures of you for the paper? And he's explaining, like, oh, yeah, that'd be great. So he takes some pictures. And, and meanwhile, the dogs, of course, are getting a little antsy. And so we start whipping donuts in the, in the bay as, as uh, Tom was talking to them, the photographers getting pictures and thinking, this is, this is okay. This, you know, we'll, just, so we'll just circle back around and pick them back up, which worked out fine. That's pretty much what we ended up doing. And then back, went back up. And, and, and I, I felt bad. I apologized. I said, you know, we were here a week ago, and there were just tons of people on the lake. I said, I'm, I'm sorry you didn't really get more pictures for, you know, He's like, oh no, that was fine. That's all I needed. It was just a few pictures. So then I got to go for a dog sunrise. So it was pretty, pretty fun. I said, okay, as long as you got a big time, that's, that works. And then uh, the other more interesting media thing was last winter I got contacted of a PBS show that uh, that was taping in the area. And they wanted to know about, you know, we'd really like to bring a PBS crew up and a camera crew and do some, some live video for this, for this television show. Okay, that's, you know, sure, fine, whatever. So, we, you know, they said, do you, do you want to go into the boundary waters? Oh, no, we don't, we don't need to be in the boundary waters. We just want to get some, we just want to get some film to go along with the story. I'm like, all right, well, whatever. It's, your, it's your TV show. I'm, you know, I, I'm going to run my dogs and, you know, that's fine. That's how it works. That, we can do that. I can do that. I don't care. So, we set this whole thing up and I'm working with the people in St. Paul in, in our office to try to get this all orchestrated and, and uh, the film crew is out of Boston or something crazy. So I've got these folks who come in, and some of them had actually been up to Iditarod, so they were they were not new to the whole dog sledding part. So all right, that's good. So we're getting all set up and getting ready to go, and we're gonna just we're keeping it simple. So we're gonna run from my yard out onto the onto this road, which happens to be a plow road, which means breaking is kind of sketch. And then we're going to go out onto this lake, and I've given them all kinds of options on places where we could do this so that they could get some video that they wanted to get. Okay, well, we're going to, let's go out onto the lake. Okay, this is the length of the lake, and this is about how long it'll take us. Okay, that, that should be great. That'll work. Okay, so we get going, or we're getting ready to get going, and the cameraman is like, well, I'm going to be right here. And he's pointing at the sled, and I'm standing there, so I've got the driving wall, which is what you hold on to when you're steering. And then in front of you, about where... Sean's body is, is where my first dogs are. So a sled's here between me and the dog. And the cameraman says, well, I'm going to be right here. Okay. And then he pulls out this big camera and he's like, yeah, I'm just going to get some video of you. Well, you know, while you're taking off. And I'm like, you're going to stand right here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's okay, right? And I'm like, well, I can, I can kind of see the dogs around you. So I'm like, all right, well, so we're going to go out of my yard, and then we're going to hit this road, and then we're going to be going down the road. So it's a little bit, there's a couple spots where it might be a little sketchy for you. And he's like, I'll be all right. Okay, just so you know, I can't really see around you, so if the dog stopped to poop or whatever, I might not see it. So if we suddenly stop quickly, that might be why. Well, it'll be fine. I'm glad one of us thinks this is going to be fine, so sure enough, you know, we get ready to go on that. So I've got one cameraman, I've got the producer and another cameraman and another vehicle, so that we're going, to, we're going to run to the car, we're going to meet you on the road. Okay? We're going to try and get past you so we can get some video. Whatever, it's your show, I'm running dogs, I'm happy, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm 
this is fine, whatever works for you. We go out of the road, and of course, it's a plowed road, so I'm standing on the brake, which is basically two little carbide points that stick into the ground with whatever weight I can put on them, which makes, basically makes a whole lot of noise, so you get this loud kind of <laughs> as we're going down the road, which if you're a team of sled dogs and you hear that sound, and you know that somebody's trying to slow you down, often you get exactly the reverse effect. They like, oh, she's trying to slow down, we should go faster. <laughs> so, which of course, we, you know, I can't see anything because I got the cameraman right here, and the dog are hearing that sound, and so they're like, we should go faster. So I smoke past the car with the producer and the other cameraman, and I see them, and they're looking at me, and, and we go blasting past, and I'm trying to stop them, and finally they stop, and they're like, yeah, we didn't get any of that video. Yeah, I'm like, I'm sorry. I'm like, that was as slow as we could go. I really, I was, I was all I could do. And they're like, we're gonna go ahead and you try again. <laughs> Which they, you know, they do it. So they get down near the bowl launch. And I give them directions how to get there. We go smoking past them at the bowl launch. By this time, the cameraman's a little bit lower because we already had to dodge around the road grader, which was out grading the road. There's the snow off the road, so we almost had a head on with him. But we get around him and we get to the lake, and I get onto the lake, and there's snow on the lake, so I can stop. <sighs> We're someplace where I've got a good layer of snow. I can stop and put snow hook in. And the producer comes running down, and I said, This is the lake I was telling you about, so I tell her what the distance is, and she just looks at me and she's like, yeah, that's going to be a little bit longer than we really have time for. Oh. Okay. Could you could you turn it? She's like, you were saying something about a gravel pit up here. I'm like, yeah, the heliport's right up there. I said, there's a loop around the heliport that's just like a half mile loop. She's like, could you turn around and run them up to the heliport loop? Um, sure. <laughs> so I'm like, all right. I said, so here's how this, I'm going to need you to come stand here on this. So I'm going you know, to put the hook in good. Just stand on this. And, and I will, kind of like I did with Marty, I'm like, I'm going to go up and I'm going to walk him around in a big circle and the sled's going to spin. Just stand on, stay standing on this and, and hold on. So she's like, okay. <laughs> Swing him around. Like... So I get him moving around and I'm like, my worry is because we've run the lake before that they're going to go around and then because there's a really nice trail, they're going to be like, oh, who would rather be back on that trail again? So I get him spun around and... We go off and we do the heliport loop and we get to the park, back to the parking lot and it all goes smoothly and they get some video. And I'm like, do you think you can do that again? Um, if you guys can help me turn the team around, we'll go off and we can run around and you know, the heliport again and some half mile with the dogs. And meanwhile, the dogs are like, y'all are crazy. And we're like, that's So we spin them around and up we go and come back down. But, you know, by the time everything gets done, they, they got their film. I, at some point in time, they're going to release it. Go up and make the look that we always make and, and come back. But there's always that chance that they'll decide to go a different way. And of course, you know, I'm running along. And all of a sudden, I, as I'm dying, <gasps> as I'm running in my winter boots, here comes the team of dogs back at me. And I'm like, oh, good, here we go. So I stop running. And I can see my lead dogs both looking at me. And they're kind of like, we think we can take her. <laughs> I can get around her. Yeah, yeah. And, and I'm looking at them like, you guys need to stop. And they're like, mm, maybe. Yeah, and then at the last, as, as they were coming up to me, and kind of I could see them planning to dodge her off, was able to jump in front of them and grab them. And once you get the lead dog stopped, then everybody else is like, oh, well, party's over then, I guess. I guess now we've got to carry you again. <laughs> so that was, a, that was kind of a. a Unfortunately, I wish I could say that it only happened to me once, but I've, I've also heard that you're not a real washer unless you've been dumped and or dragged by your team at least once, so, so there's, there is that. Um, let's see, I'm trying to think of other dogs, like dog and sled stories here I have. Um, oh, I did a trip. Uh, years ago. The Forest Service has, um, over the years, they, they contract with different folks to, to do some dog, um, dog sled patrols or to haul equipment in. A lot of times it's easier to take in things like um, latrines are much easier to carry in a dog sled because you can pile a bunch of them in there, you don't have to carry it on your back. Um, so they'll often send in equipment and send in stuff by dog team. I went in a number of years ago with a couple of different Forest Service folks, and we were up on uh, 
I think we were up on South that year. <clears throat> we went in off Gun Flint and, and into South Lake, and we thought, we're going to do something different because, you know, often you take a tent with, and we're like, oh, we'll, we'll, well, let's camp in our, let's camp in our sled bags. I've, you know, never done that before, and I know lots of folks who, you know, who, when they get to where they're going, they, they set up in, you know, their dogs, and they sleep in their, you know, do it pretty rusty, and they sleep right in their sled bags, and they don't have to carry a tent or anything. So we're like, okay, we're going to try that. So I get out there with the Forest Service folks, and they got their, their rig set up, and I got my dogs out, and I get my, get my sleeping bag all set up in my tent, or in my sled. It's, the sled's not quite as long as I am tall, and I'm a short person, but I'm like, oh, I can fit in there. And I so I'm in there sleeping, and I look out, or I'm getting ready to sleep, and I look out, and all my dogs are curled up and sleeping, except for this one little short-haired dog I had named Hunter. And she just kept looking at me, and giving me this pathetic look. <laughs> And it wasn't really cold, but she just sat there and she just kept sitting there looking, I'm so miserable. Finally, oh, the biggest sucker in the world. So I get up and I go over and I get her and I hook her and I feel this dog pushing against me. And I'm like, what are you doing? I'm like, curl up in a ball like a dog. And no, she's pushing and I can't get cups. So finally I end up like spooning around my dog who's occupying the biggest space in the slit and I can't get her to move. Kind of like this is as good as it's gonna get because she saw it logs by the time I'm like still trying to get all squared away. Finally, I gave up and, and went to sleep around her. I get up the next morning, I get dressed, dog's still in the sleeping bag. I'm getting food ready and water and all the rest of the dogs. I'm like, Come on, Hunter. She's like, mm, No, I'm good right here. I'm like, This is perfect. I, I don't need breakfast. I'm good right here. If I had to like pick her up and drag her, I'm like, Come on. I got such a good night's sleep. Thanks. <laughs> Glad one of us did. Um, well, I have a few other stories. I don't know if you all have any questions. I, there's about ten minutes left, so if you've got questions, I can I can answer any questions. Otherwise, I can rattle away more stories or make things up. <laughs> <laughs> all those things. Yeah. Go ahead. Do you know what the title of the PBS show will be? Um, it is America's Forests with. I should know his name. Um, from the Rolling Stones. Uh, What's that? Isn't it the keyboardist? Yes, it's the keyboardist for the Rolling Stones. What's this? I can't remember his name. It's America's Forest. Um, Chuck. I'll think of him when I'm not thinking of it. But yeah, they've, they've had uh, it's, it's a fairly new show. Um, but they kind of travel around and, and check out different forests of the areas. And, and they did some. Uh, they did some stuff with the folks in Grand Portage. I think they were down around um, the Finland area doing some things. So they <clears throat> they kind of travel around the area and talk with a lot of folks who live and work in the woods. Um, just kind of about the forest and recreation things. And they were specifically looking at some recreation stuff. I think they did some moose survey stuff um, on the Portage too. So it should be interesting. Um, yeah, I just can't I just can't get this of uh, the full title of the show. It should be interesting, I hope. <laughs> or like I said, I'll, you know, it'll be, I haven't seen absolutely none of the video, I'm really kind of curious about like the look on my face as I'm trying to dodge around the guy to see what the heck is coming. But I, I kind of wish I would have seen the look on the uh, face of the, uh, the, the greater grabber too as we waited and waited and like, maybe he's not coming so we went. And he runs dog, so it's not, it's not like he's surprised to see us out there and he's, you know, He's run dogs himself, so that was not a huge shocker for him. But you know, to come around the corner and go, oh, dang. Yes? Could you talk a little bit about snow conditions and, like, in a typical year, when would you be able to go out on the lakes in terms of, like, what's your season for doing that? And then I'm really curious yeah. about the slush. Oh. Because I know on our lakes and when we go out skiing, we mm -hmm. often slush up. And is that yeah. really dangerous for you? Do the dogs know it's coming typically, or is it? Um, are they, they kind of oblivious until they're? They don't necessarily know that it's coming. It's kind of like they're like they're disappointed, and all of a sudden they just there they went. Um, so the season kind of really varies. Um, you want good ice conditions, and that you know, so that's a big piece of it. Is what are you getting for ice? So. It's, it's hard because you want snow, because again, 
sleds stop better on snow than they do on ice. So you want to have good ice conditions so that you know you're safe, but you also want some snow on that so that you know you can stop. And if you get too much snow, then you, that makes it harder for the ice conditions to really you know, be solid. So if we get a good, if we get a good freeze up when we get a good ice, um, we start with that good ice base. That's that's ideal, and then that you know snow. The other piece of having snow is really you've got to get from one lake to the next. And if you don't have enough snow cover on your portage trails, um, not only can you not stop, which is dangerous, but also you have run the risk of um, wrecking equipment because if you step on a brake and there's not enough snow there, and you catch a rock with your brake. Um, I have personally broken the brake off of a sled, um, and then had no break at all, except for my foot, and, uh, and a foot trying to stop a six, you know, six dogs towing you along, you know, moving the snow doesn't really work, especially knowing, oh, there's rocks under here, and if I push too hard and catch my, you know, catch a rock, that, you know, I break a leg, not really, not really a lot. Um, so it's usually, oh gosh, I hate, to, I hate to make any general, you know, general, generalizations about it, but you know, December, depending on, on how the snow conditions, and we fight this every year with races too, we want the mail run, um, which is a race that, that goes from um, Trail Center um, up, up into uh, Seagull area, near the Seagull Guard Station and back. You know, some years it's, you know, we've got great ice conditions and we're, you know, we're ready to go, and other years we're like, mm -hmm. you know, we're gonna kind of watch and, and make sure we've got, you know, we've got good solid ice and we don't have to run around and, Strictly on land, so you know. Sometimes it's you know, you're into January, you're like please be good conditions, please be good conditions. So it, it can shorten up that window of, of good running. And then years like this year, where you know, we kept getting snow and snow and snow in April, and just like the winter never ended. The slush can be. I've had mixed um, mixed results with slush. I have been up uh, on Knife Lake where you know you're running through standing water and slush, and the dogs don't care, especially if it's, you know, spring running can be notoriously slushy. Um, and they don't, they really don't seem to mind. I mean, I've been standing on the brake pad on the little, basically a chunk of snowmobile track that you stand on to slow things down, and had just a rooster tail of water flying up behind me, you know, going along and like, you know, reaching an arm out and just squeezing the, the water out of my gloves because they just, they're just getting soaked, and, you know, from all the water spraying. And the dogs don't care. They're, they're having a good time. They're happy. They're running along. Uh, you have to be careful about getting them to some place where you can get them out of the water to rest and just, you know, to, to be able to dry out. And they'll dry themselves out um, if you get them up off, out of that. Um, and then the very next day, the temperature drops, and all of that slush that you just ran through the day before, it's all solid, and now you're running along on top of it, just like then. It's, a, it's an odd thing to have happen. The dogs don't, you know, other than the have to work a little bit harder if you're dragging, you know, the sled through through slush. It just slows everything down. It makes it more miserable for us. They don't really tend to care too much. Yeah. At what age are they able to pull sled, and at what age do you retire them? Um, so typically, once they get to about a year. They can pull. You wouldn't necessarily want to do that competitively with them, but you want to get them started uh, as young dogs so that they learn. Um, and then the retirement age, you know, typically for me, dogs that are about 18 months are a good. That's a good age to start doing some small racing with them, um, camping stuff. You know, a year they're fine. Um, you don't want to work them real hard at that age. You want to get them up to that 18 month old. To do it before they start doing a lot of hard stuff, but they can go out and run and train and, and do some easy stuff. Um, and by easy, you know, 20 miles, 25 miles is pretty, pretty, you know, pretty easy running for them. Retirement really depends on the dog. Um, I have, um, I have a dog who was on my race team this last year, who I think was he on nine now, ten. Okay. He's ten, um, and he ra he's raced. I got him from another musher, so he raced with another musher when he was younger. I got him, he's done almost every race that I have done, and he has looked better on some of those races than some of the younger dogs, because he's physically well put together dog, he's in good condition, and he knows how to pace himself, and that's a huge thing, and that's, that's what you see with dogs. The, the other piece about running younger dogs is younger dogs don't necessarily 
just like people. Younger people don't always pace themselves well, and younger dogs don't always pace themselves well, and it takes them a little bit of time to figure out that efficiency. How I want to work hard, but I don't want to work too hard. I want to work hard enough to get the job done, but not so hard that I wear myself out, and then I'm just, you know, just beat by the end of it. So um, some dogs figure that out, and they are, um, they are really good for what seems like a crazy long amount of time. I think most of the dogs that I have, um, once I get about 10 or 11, I, had, uh, I have a, a bunch of dogs who are, I think, now 12. Um, and those folks, those guys did a 40-mile race a couple of years ago with a, a friend of mine who was doing some training. She wanted to run, run a team, and she wanted to, to, to train and learn how to run. I said, well, I've got these older dogs. They can't do a really long race, but a 40-mile race, you know, as long as you put the time in and train them and get them built up, you're not going to just hook them up and run 40 miles. You've got to build up that endurance just like anything else. I said, but if you're not worried about going fast, they will be able to run that distance for you. And they did. They didn't go particularly fast, but they did, you know, they did just fine for that race and they actually came out looking pretty good. By the end of it, so it really, it really does vary. And then I've, I've got a dog now who is 17 and a half, who's uh, who's a retired sled dog, but she's uh, she's a house dog. You just, the, it's interesting to see the difference in that old old dog trucks around the house. And I've got dogs who are you know, three, four years younger than her, who just look so it's like they just look rough. And they're like, oh, you know, moving a little stiff today. Who jumps up and she comes around and I'm like, yeah, I would not think you're the oldest dog in my in my house. It's, it's very individualized, I guess. Just like people. You know, you know, I, I see some I meet some I meet folks and they're like, oh I'm I'm 85 years old. And I'm like, really? Because you don't look 85 years old. I hope I look when I think to be 85. I hope I look half as good as you don't look that old at all. So dogs are the same way. Yeah. I have two questions. First one is the dogs that you use for your racing teams and the dogs you use in your career, are they the same dogs? Usually yes, but usually a little age difference. That's where an older dog can be really good um, you know, for doing work stuff mm -hmm. because they're a little bit slower, they're not, they pace themselves a little bit better. Usually the leaders have a little more experience and, and a lot of times it comes down to what your lead dogs um, can and will do for you. Um, if you spend a lot, we do a lot of late training. And so those lead dogs who are used to leading on those lakes and, and finding their way out of the pads, um, the more experience they have, the more comfortable they are with that, and, and the better they will do it. I have been on lakes where I've had younger lead dogs who do great to a point, and then kind of like their little brains kind of explode. Like, hey, I was doing so good, but I'm just, I'm just stressed out. And we've literally been in the middle of the lake, whipping donuts around with, you know, a game board out the front, come on, come on, follow me guys, and they're like, yeah, no, we're not going to do this. Just let them go and see this like, this is not how that's supposed to go. So, you know, typically what happens is I'll use all these dogs for races, um, and then once they get a little bit older, they'll tend to be better for, for doing travel, because they're also, they're a little more patient, so when you stop and, you know, check a fisherman, the older dogs are like, oh good, we're taking a rest now. this is great. Whereas the younger dogs are like, why are we stopping? I thought we were going to be going. And then you just, it, it becomes more work for me and it becomes not as much fun for them. The old dogs are like, oh good, the rest of that's perfect. That's exactly what I wanted. That's great. The, yeah. second, the second question is, uh, you know, there can be some dangerous dudes out there. You know? Yes. Do you, have, you, have you run into situations that uh, are really scary? Not in the woods, not the, not in the boundary waters, not with any of the dog stuff that I've done. I've always been very fortunate. But again, that's another another good reason to have two folks, and you've always got you know, somebody that you, someone again to take care of the dogs. But also a part of that is also being a, a backup set of eyes for you know, for your work partner. You know. Typically, most of what we do um, work wise we do by ourselves. So nine times out of ten, if I'm in the woods. Checking somebody, whether it's winter or not, and if I'm on my snowmobile, I might be making, the, you know, making the round of the lakes by myself on a snowmobile. And so it's, you know, you often find yourself, you know, if you're going to run into anybody who's sketchy, you know, you're going to deal with them, you know, whether they're in the boundary waters or they're, you know, not in the boundary waters. It's just, I think sometimes the the difficulty of getting into those more remote places kind of thins out the, oh. the hurt a little bit. So. Yeah. 
<laughs> but not to say that they aren't there, because they're, you know, certainly you know, we've had some issues here and there. But I've been fortunate that any time I've been with the dogs, I've been um, not, I've not run into anything real, real sketchy. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I found that show, was it America's yeah. First with Chuck Level? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Thank mm -hmm. you. Of course. Mm -hmm. I was like, the name, I was like, the last name, I was like, right on the tip of my brain, but I was like, no, it's not, it's not what I think it is. So, yeah, thank you. Okay, yes. Okay, so you are a full-time conservation officer. Yes. You care for 35 plus dogs. How much time do you spend caring for your dogs? That just... Seems amazing. <laughs> <laughs> On a daily basis? Sure. Whatever. Okay. Um, well, every, every morning I get up and make sure that they have water and they all get a little, this time of year they all get a cookie, uh, partly because it just gives them some, they don't need to eat twice a day or they would all be so fat and round that they would never move. Um, so they all get a little, a little treat in the morning and I can check water and make sure everybody looks good and that they're, that they're doing all right. So that, you know, for me it doesn't take me very long to make the round. I'm, really motivated, I might scoop poop in the morning, so it might take me anywhere from five minutes to a half hour by the time I go out and scoop everybody. Um, and then I have some puppies, so I've got to take food out for the puppies, so that takes a little bit of time, you know, making sure that the puppies eat. The house dogs are probably, this, you know, when you've got a bunch of old seniors, senior dogs, and sometimes it's trying to, you know, entice them to eat, so that takes a little bit of time. So on average, about a half hour in the morning, and then in the evenings, um, Half hour, 45 minutes uh, for me to go out, you know, mix up food, take food to everybody. Again, check water, so I'm going to scoop poop. You know, that takes me a little bit more time. So probably hour and a half to two hours a day, just just general maintenance stuff. Would you agree about the same? Except twice as long for me. Okay. <laughs> if you're an amputee, it'll take you a little bit longer. <laughs> not too good legs, and, you know, if I'm in, not, not feeling too rough, yeah. So about that, and then anytime you start adding in. So we'll start fall training, depending on what the conditions are and the temperatures are. Um, sometimes as early as uh, late August, we'll start doing training. And then that just becomes how many dogs you're gonna hook up at a time. So we'll start doing, we'll start hooking up dogs. So by that I mean, I'll take a four-wheeler and get all of the lines that we would use for winter running and harnesses and everything. We start harnessing up dogs. And, and basically in the fall, you're teaching them manners and you're teaching them to pace themselves, and you're teaching them to get along, and to kind of learn the routines. When you can stop them, you look into a four-wheeler, it's a lot easier to stop a four-wheeler than it is a, a dog sled. So it gives, it gives me a, um, a bit of control over the situation with the dogs. So we start hooking them up in small groups so that we can start getting them out so they can exercise and train and kind of get used to wearing the harness again and the balance of the harness and, and kind of getting used to their neighbors. Because sometimes they'll be running as dogs as dogs get older and they move from the regular race team to, to more of the retirees and the, the kind of the boundary waters teams, those guys, you know, they're running with dogs that maybe they haven't run before run with before. I've got some puppies, so those puppies will start to learn to run and so they'll be puppies are always kind of bouncy and you know, <laughs> full of energy and some dogs, some older dogs are better about that than others. So you, you kind of gotta get everybody working together and getting all getting along. So we'll start doing that in the fall, and that can, depending on how, how many things they eat, um, because of course energetic dogs start chewing things, and if you're lucky they're not chewing their neighbor, they're just chewing the lines and things, and you know, getting loose and running around and doing crazy stuff. So that'll start, and, and we'll start doing probably six mile runs, which will take us actual run time about an hour. So it'll start about a couple hours a day of just running, just kind of ramp up from there, hours and hours and hours of, of running and sitting on a four wheeler and you know getting that training piece done so that when the snow comes, we're ready to transition to, to sled and, and be ready and, and have the control and have the dogs understand everything and be ready to, to ready to go. So so a lot of time. <laughs> Long answer, but yeah, yeah. Anything else? Can we pet your dog? Sure, absolutely. This is Sean. If you came in late, this is Sean. Sean is a uh, medically retired sled dog. He would love to be petted. I have some little snacks I'll give him to me. Sean, do you want to? I can unhook him, but I don't know if you want to. Do you want to get up, Sean? 
<laughs> the bell is right here. You show up in the bell. Well, thank you all uh, for being here.